Good to have everyone. Um, today I'm so proud of standing here to present you uh, about microservices. And I'm Michael. Uh, I'm working for a Property Guru. And uh, uh, I have mm, learned about microservices for a few years already. And I feel it's quite powerful. And I think m many of you is already know about microservices. Uh, and uh, but the one, the problem is like everybody want to do it, but really usually people don't know how to do it. <coughs> so today I will share my experience. I will I also created a demo uh, for you to migrate from the legacy system to microservice system. So let's start. <coughs> so everybody talking about <coughs> microservice, and I'm a full stack software developer, uh, and I'm been uh, do programming for nine years already and uh, knowing about microservice around like two three years and know a bit about DevOps stuff only so if you want to know more about me you can go to the link <coughs> and in our in property guru this is our dev stack that we involve a lot of uh, technology inside and not only this we are still involved more and more so today I will talk about first thing I will introduce you about microservices. Uh, just briefly go through it. Second thing is like I will go through the migration from the legacy system to the microservice system, and then I will talk about the security resilience and then how to deploy. Okay, Let's talk about microservices. So this one uh, I think like twenty years ago so our code base is very messy. Like spaghetti, and every uh, oh, the code is uh, very um, tightly coupled to each other, and then after ten years, uh, they uh, innovated and implement the SOA, SOA architecture. So the code is less um, uh, coupling to each other, but it's still quite uh, messy. So nowadays, the people try to break it smaller and go need microservices so all the component is uh, completely decoupled it's like this so uh, everything previously is quite messed up so if you organize this properly then it looks very tidy and easy to manage easy to control so <coughs> and this is a concept behind that so previously they have only one app very big huge complex and there's a lot of things inside connect to one database layer. And now they uh, separate, they break down the, the database into a small piece. And only the service that needs the database will be asset to it. And they bundle it in this, uh, a, a thing called uh, container. And each service will talk to each other over the HTTP layer, mostly. And yeah, this is a uh, architecture. Um, uh, this is more technical compared to the first image. <coughs> now, I am talk about the migration. Um, in order to do migration, I mean, um, there's a lot of tool we can use. Like for make, uh, building a container, we have Docker and uh, Eric with uh, uh, Eric is a successor of the, uh, sorry, Docker is a successor of the Eric C. And uh, in order to for different components to talk to each other, we need a message layer. If you look at this one, they, uh, at the end uh, photo, they have acid in the dumb messaging environment. <coughs> so that means in order to the different service to talk to each other, we need to have a messaging system uh, for to communicate. <coughs> yeah. So uh, in this uh, in this demo, I will use Docker for containerizing uh, our system and uh, Redis for messaging. There's a lot of things you can use, whatever you want. OK, so let's talk about the legacy system. See, this is very traditional system. Uh, I just want to get, give an example. So we have, when we start, we uh, do uh, some action, like we lock at the beginning of the request. And then we do a process, and we lock the response, and then respond like what? Uh, John uh, just said now. And the code is l very linear. And when uh, the code, when the logic is added and more required, you keep adding up the code into the function. And then the method becomes very big. Like I, I, I usually see in like 200, 300, even some like 2,000 live 
of a function, yeah, especially in the controller. Usually people put a lot of controller because that is where logic happen. And uh, for example, if you look at here, I see I, when I have a form submitted, I will lock the uh, form, and then I do a process. I call the service, it's just like full, like whatever service you want. And then after the service is uh, done, and I lock the process. So uh, from time to time, this will be messy, and this is very unclean code. So uh, I will make an improvement for this. So I will implement the uh, event uh, concept. So whenever, like for for example, uh, for previous uh, application, uh, when the request is coming, the form is submitted. I will trigger an event, and then whatever subscriber is sub listening to that event will be run on that event, and then we, uh, after that they can find another event and continue like this. So it's um, all the component is uh, start uh, decoupling each other. And by doing like this, it's very easy to add more uh, logic. So uh, if you take a look at the code here, see uh, when the form submitted, I just redirect back. The code is look like I redirect back to the home page directly. But the thing is like when uh, the form is processed, it triggers some event. This is the symphony code. So if you want to know more about the event, you can look for the symphony uh, form events. You will know more about it. So this is a code for the subscribe to the event. So uh, the first one is the form builder. So in the form builder, you add more uh, event subscribers to the form. And then uh, in the big spot below it, uh, this is like where is the, how is the subscriber work. And it will register the what event is subscribed to and how, uh, what is the action when the event is fired. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the beta one, uh, you will see that uh, this is very fake action. So I just sleep for 10 seconds. So this is just simulate the, the long process um, activity in uh, our <coughs> system. And after that, I will trigger another event called full completed event. And for the lock, <coughs> for the lock uh, subscriber, I will subscribe to both when form is submitted and when is uh, uh, the service is completed. So by doing like this, if I, if I want to have more action when the form submitted, for example, I can just keep adding more event, uh, more uh, subscriber. So uh, by doing like this, so the, the, the logic is bundled in the smaller class, and it's easier for us to control, to read, and also easier for us to test it. Okay, so one higher level, this look a bit com more complex. Uh, and uh, um, on the box here is uh, the, the longer box, where the rectangle one here is like the message uh, cure. Uh, it will be done by uh, Redis. So like for example, I will start from the beginning here. Uh, when we have a request coming in, uh, I will send an event to the channel. And all the, um, how can, all the service will subscribe to that uh, channel to see if you have any event. So when is event coming, I call it the watcher. So keep watching for the uh, info. So after the info is coming in, all the watcher will uh, forward the data somehow process of and forward the data in a message list. And uh, there's another worker who will keep pulling from the uh, message list to have to process the data. Yeah. So uh, look at this one. I have, for example, I have a tree watcher and tree worker. So tree watcher and tree worker is working under a, a cap load balancing mechanism. There's no load balance, uh, no load balancer here. But uh, I mean, later I will explain how the load balancing work here. Uh, so in this one, uh, the blue one is a lock, uh, the lock service. The green one is a full service. So for example, after the full service is done, it will uh, push a message to the message list of the locker. 
so the locker can lock that uh, as well. So whenever the data is coming to the message list, the worker will pull it up and uh, do their job. And now if you look at the code, original code before, you can see that now I just need to publish the event into the, uh, the channel. And all the rest will be uh, handled by the, uh, the service. One thing, if you uh, look at this uh, diagram, then you see that the, the red one is how the, 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 the time taken to, from the request to res respond. So uh, there's a lot of process can, need to be done for that request. But the thing is, like for the request, it's not really needed to wait for it to be completed. We just pass it to the, another third party service, and then we respond to the user directly. For example, when you upload a video, uh, processing a video usually takes very long time. So once you upload a video, uh, I will tell you, OK, your video is uploaded, and it's being processing by our back end. So user know that, OK, uh, everything is OK. I just keep, uh, need to wait. Rather than like, waiting for like, five minutes, 10 minutes, even a few hours to, for the video is, uh, to be respond. OK, so this is a code for subscribing the process. Uh, I, I think I, I don't no need to go through this one. Uh, I have I will later I will share the code for the GitHub repo for this one, so people if uh, interested can just go there and take a look. Okay, I'm talking about the scalability. Uh, scalability. So I run this uh, this project with uh, only one watcher and one worker. And because you previously you remember the process take five sec uh, ten seconds because it sleep for ten seconds. So now uh, I only have uh, I send a three request and it take like thirty seconds because it add up for ten by ten. So it uh, eventually is thirty seconds. Now I scale it up to three watcher and three workers. The time is only fourteen seconds. So remember, ten seconds is only for sleeping. So only four seconds left is for processing. If you launch more watcher, like 1,000 watcher, then the, mm, when the request coming, it's just a matter of like 10 or 20 seconds only. So uh, also when we are doing uh, mm, this architecture, you need to uh, be aware of uh, broadcasting your event and doing load balancing. Because the thing is like, for example, uh, we have a three uh, log service uh, listening to the um, event. So now when is event coming, three log service will start running. You don't want to have a three log record in our database, right? You only have one. So you need to have a like, locking mechanism to make sure that whenever a request coming in or the event is fired, only one worker will run. Instead of own tree running, and then we have duplicated data in our backend. Okay, about uh, I'm talking about the uh, resilience because, like, uh, by running um, microservices, uh, so you can launch your microservice in the different <coughs> servers, um, or maybe locally, or maybe in cross the region from US, Asia, and. For example, one or few servers go down, the system is still running fine. And after it go back, it's a recover, if, if not enough uh, resource. Of course, if the resource already enough, then no need to recover, nothing to recover, right? Uh, I will run the demo on this one. I'm not sure if anyone can see. <coughs> Everybody can see it right now? OK. I'm looking to this one. This one is running on my Raspberry Pi farm. I have around like 10 Raspberry Pi at my home. And I do, <laughs> yeah, I, I really like it. It's really, really fun uh, working with the Raspberry Pi. And I build a, a cluster of the Raspberry Pi. And this is uh, one of the master nodes. So in this one, I run my website. 
uh, cone uh, Gigari legacy, a cone legacy because I'm building a new one. And you can see here I have three replica. <coughs> okay, I'm going to see how the I'm trying to take down one node and to see how the system react with the, the, the event. It's difficult to see, right? I will open a new one. Okay. Uh, and where you can see on the back? Okay, so uh, here you can see that I have uh, it's running on three nodes. Three Raspberry Pi server. One is a two, one, two, two, and three, two. You can see the node here. Okay. Now I'm logging. For example, I'm uh, I'm logging mm -hmm. to the number Raspberry Pi two two. Okay, the number is here. Raspberry Pi means the second generation. Three means the third generation. Yeah. So for example, here uh, I can see. Uh, uh, Swarm. Ah, Docker node. Yeah, I have this is a list of the nodes. I have uh, uh, eight uh, servers uh, farming a cluster here, and I have three master. One is uh, one is elected as a leader. And the other one is uh, readable. So one of the master going down, the one of the two remaining will be elected as a leader and <coughs> start managing the cluster. So I come back to the list. Yeah. Now I'm looking to the uh, server 2.2. So now I'm, I run as, okay. I monitor all the service first. So there command to monitor it is a watch. So this command will uh, reload every second, and we can see now. Okay, now serving down is take quite. Uh, I think it's uh, around like half minute. You can see the so node is running, updating here. Okay, now you see, two two is gone. Now three two is elected as a new node, and it start launching a new service there. So by doing like this, uh, you can have a lot of server connected and farming a cluster. And like for example, one server is going down for like hardware or whatever reason, you can easily take it out, replace a new one. Especially we have a lot of cloud service like AWS, Google Cloud. It's very easy for us to scale and to um, resist with uh, a lot of its error. So uh, this is the demo of the resilience. Okay. Next one is about deployment. When we make a new change, we want to make uh, make sure that it goes through an automated uh, process to deploy our code to our, for our production, right? And uh, in this demo, I use uh, GitLab CI with the uh, runner. So this is a uh, code for the uh, GitLab CI. Um, if you want to know more about it, then you can just go to the gitlab.com. Uh, I think I mean, I've been using GitLab for a few years. They are great. Have a lot of free service like Git, uh, Docker registry, and also free runner for CI as well. Uh, so I use CI to build my uh, Docker images, and I'm 
I'm not sure if you can uh, read, uh, can see the, the, the code here or not, uh, but uh, I have two steps here. One is the build and deploy, as the first one. And then this, this two part is about uh, building the Docker image. And the last one is deploy it to uh, production. I can open it in uh, PPStorm so we can see uh, not this project. This is okay. This is CI. So uh, ah, this one is very own version. So I check out the latest one. I no, I think I I forgot to push this because this is on another machine. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I will say say the course this this one later if you, anybody can want to. Okay, so basically, if you could look at uh, on the right side, uh, the build step we have I have two tasks running uh, to build the image for AIM architecture because I'm running Raspberry Pi. It's running uh, AIM uh, architecture. And the other one, I have a task to build the uh, 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 86 uh, for the normal uh, Docker images. After that, I've been deployed. So, no, I, yeah, I think I push it. Oh, OK. I have it in version 2. So I check. Uh, Docker <coughs> 2 two dot zero. This one is oh not this repo. It check out Docker two dot zero. Okay. Yeah, here. Yeah. Sorry. I haven't merged it into master. So here you have two steps, build and deploy. And this is the build image, uh, the build task for building uh, Docker for normal platform. And this is uh, specially built for AIM architectures. So. Uh, if you want to understand about this code, you can just go to the GitLab CI to check. And then after that, I will deploy it uh, uh, to my servers. And I, uh, here is I pull the, the latest image. And then after that, I will uh, update my uh, Docker Swarm. Uh, I form the cluster uh, using the Docker Swarm. And later, you will see that this is a rolling update. It's update one by one. It's not like delete everything and update uh, everything in one shot. I can go to the my doc my my GitLab here. You see, it have a, a free uh, sorry free uh, Docker registry as well, and this is where you run the um, deployment. And this this is the one uh, I just run before. So you can see we have two steps of the build here and I have deploy here. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I make a change in my code and let's see how it deploy to a product. So first thing, ah no, I'm not open. I'm not playing chess now. 
Ok, cool. This is my website. It's a legacy website. I'm going to do updating this one. So basically, I just moved house um, one two months ago. So I need to update my uh, address. For example, at the footer here. So actually, I I I, I purposely left one word left. Like it's actually it should be a Geylang Road, but I forget the word uh, road. So now I update it, and we we'll see that it how it deploy to our website. So I cannot uh, increase the size from here, but like for example, this is a file I built before. I I deleted this repo already, so that's why I call it legacy, because I I I don't need it anymore. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is where it is. So, yeah, so I make a change and then I rename this file because uh, this file will be catch. Okay, here is detected uh, my reference in the index.html. So I refit the as well. Okay, good. <coughs> so I have two file chains here. Yeah, all right. So now I will push this one. <coughs> Come in. And now I push this. So let's go to a pilot here. So it's pushed uh, already, and we go to pilot to refresh. You can see that there are one pilot pending. See, and I click on that. Have two, have three views here. Two is waiting for run. It's, I think it's already started running. Yes, and now we wait around. I think two two minutes. Let's see how long does it take for the previous one. Uh, is this one? Ah, uh, this one. Three minutes. So, uh, in the meantime, anyone have questions? Uh, just now you talk about the performance, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. So the let me go back to the my talk first. <coughs> this, you are talking about this one, right? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, the first thing, the um, I, the worker and the watcher, uh, I write it in GoLang. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, but you can write it in PHP, no problem. Can uh, uh, No, this one. Okay, it's, uh, this one is not rely on any language at, at all. This is because not because the, the GoLang can run a uh, multi-thread. It's because like I run, I I use, I choose GoLang because I want. People know that when you implement microservice architecture, you are free to choose what level language you want to, to use. Yeah. So not because of the multiple uh, worker. But how are you running the multiple? Okay, I'm showing you now. Here. This actually I capture this one from this screen. Okay. This is on my local. Now I have a file uh, docker is running here. I turn it off, I delete everything, I start from beginning so we can see. Docker. 
compose dot okay now it's killing all the docker con uh, containers and very soon you will see on the right panel is something like it's acid 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 because it's killing okay I don't have any docker uh, container here so now I'm bring them up I keep monitoring the lock here on the right side everybody can see the screen okay okay now everything is uh, everything is up already so now here you see the server is running on port uh, 8000 I'm open is this one so basically what okay I refresh this one first just to make sure that it's running okay and you can see that on the right yes on the right panel here it have request yeah this is a request it's locked to uh, the console okay now I I want to submit this to his name I just make very very simple form only so now I submit see all the workers start running <coughs> so basically the full watcher is the service watching for the news for the full service log watcher is the uh, watcher for the log service so after for example for, for the log service when it get the data like it get the hello string and it pass to the log message log message is the message list for log worker and then the log worker in this line when the log worker get the data it will lock this one so it say it's lock the string at this time this is a uh, uh, UTC time so to the lock lock is the name of the uh, da data store yeah okay and you can see from here the lock worker yes from here is finished at the 1415 right and actually it start from 145 so it takes five seconds to finish but actually the, the, the front end uh, respond immediately already so from here I increase the size here here is a request and it's uh, you can see that this one is respond in 1.9 second one and a half second people uh, everybody can see uh, I'm not okay I can enable bring it up here see one and a half second even the long process take 10 seconds so this is like help us to make our website to be more responsive uh, in terms of the uh, timing okay so now if I run three requests to the server <coughs> okay let's say a this so is b b b b b b b and this one is See, 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 see. Okay, I press enter here to separate the lock. Now I quickly send to read request. And you can see that it start processing here. So uh, on the right on the right side I have a time stamp but I think it's, uh, the screen is too small for you to, to see but uh, like for this line it is uh, 1628 so I expected the last one will be 1708 ah, I don't know it it already have time stamp here I'm so stupid sorry
What is this issue? Invalid program request. Wow. Okay, okay. I, I want to show you uh, later. I scale this one to three. So I use Docker to tr to scale it. That means I launch more container instead of like launching a multi testing. So so uh, yes. So here, this is a command to scale it up. Okay. So I scale the watcher or worker on, on up to three, and it start launching a new instance, no new con uh, containers. That's handled by Docker. Yes. So inside the, the Docker container, it's up to you to decide which language you want to write application uh, to build the microservice inside that. What, what language is Docker running? Uh, Docker is written in by Golang. Okay. Yes. That's what's, that's okay. yeah. Oh, this. Hmm. I don't know. It suddenly have a invalid this one parameter. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's implemented. Uh, see now it work. Okay, I try again. Try my luck again. So, a a a b b b and. Great. Okay. Oh, it takes a long time to finish this one. Okay. Now. Now you see it starts processing here. Okay, it's running now. You see a lot of AABBB CCC is coming up to the screen now. Yeah. And this one is start uh, from uh, 1949. Yes. Uh, yes. Three push locks. Yeah. And it stopped at uh, 2003. That means it's uh, 14 seconds. 14 seconds because I, land, I launched, I scaled it up to three uh, instant already. So now, I, if I scale it down, <coughs> it's killing uh, a service. OK, in the meantime, it's running. I'm going back to my view and refresh. It passed. So I expected it's. Uh, Launching a new one here already. Yes, it is launching. So, so this. Uh, uh, I guess it's not updated. And I will tell you why. Yes, it's not updated. The reason is because I use the same tag. So the image is, uh, there's no chain on the image name. So uh, Docker Swarm doesn't detect a, a chain. So it, now if I try a new tag, it should work. Check out the doc. Docker 3.0 <coughs> and git push docker origin. Okay, now I'm pushing to new branch and Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now I'm posting to a new brand called 3.0. And if you look at, at my CI here, uh, I only build if the the tag the tag name or brand name start with Docker. That's yeah. So now if I go to the pipeline. Yes, it's running with the Docker 3.0. And later, if you take a look here, it's running 2.0. When you come back uh, in a few minutes, it's running 3.0. Hopefully. <laughs> OK, so now we only we scale down uh, from three instance to one instance per service. I will try to send request, the same request again. A B C okay. Okay, the re request started on twenty four zero two. So now on twenty four twelve, that means ten seconds later, the first one is locked. Is here. I have a smiley face, so we can easy. And then ten seconds later, that the second one is locked. Yes, and ten seconds later is locked. So from zero two to thirty two, it take um, thirty second. Yeah, and previously it take only fourteen second. Yeah. So basically, uh, this one is just scale up the container. It's not launching a new process within the same. Uh, server. Okay, so this one, one build is finished already. Need some time. Okay, this one almost done. So I have two minutes, so anyone can ask, feel free to raise your question. Uh, do you also do automated tests at the end that will involve uh, several microservices integrated? Uh, we should do it, but I haven't done it. This is just a demo for, for us to see how is a scalable, how we can uh, manage the uh, uh, a network of microservices and how we deploy a, a new chains only. Does it take more RAM to run more uh, of course, when, when you launch a, a new one, it will take more resource. But the thing is like, for example, if you want to make sure that your service, your website is only running very fine and user will never know that if someone is uh, like go down at the back end, you can launch around 10 server. And maybe uh, three of them is only idle, uh, ideal. So whenever you uh, one server is go down, it's automatically jump to another one. And when you launch, it take consume a uh, memory of that server only. So when the that server is going uh, overloaded, it's been launched into a new one. Yeah. So this one is successful. So I think it's go to the deploy process here. Yeah, it's running here. So for your information, the two build tasks is done in free runner from uh, GitLab. So it, I, I don't have to build any server in order to, for, for it to run. So, if, uh, so that means uh, every time I push my code to my repo, it will build my uh, uh, Docker image for me. And it hosts the Docker image for me for free as well. So I really like it. Free things. <laughs> so if you want to run it, you must uh, put GoLang for Docker to run. No, no, you can choose whatever language you want. Uh, then Docker just compiles. Uh, Docker we uh, okay. Docker is the service to bundle your 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 code mm. 
inside a uh, isolated envi virtual inside isolated environment. Okay. Yes. It's just a compiler. Mm, kind of. Yes. Previously, you have a uh, VMware and uh, VirtualBox. So Docker is doing similar similar things, but not like that because they are virtualized the whole OS. But Docker is virtualized the uh, executable uh, file only. So. Yeah. Uh, it really depends how you architecture. Like for example, okay, first thing, uh, give me a second. So I'm going back to here first to see that it's uh, launching a new. You see, uh, one instance already using the third, uh, the version 3.0, and the the other two is still running version two. So is it, is this con uh, running update is update one by one only. And you see now, uh, this one is uh, going to be launched. So the mechanism is like this one. You have an update with a new image. It will kill the first one, launch the first one. And once the first one is uh, up and running fine, and it kills the next one. So it keep doing like this. So you can see it's just keep me. So now we have uh, one is already running. And this one is, so if I go to the, our, my website and reload. I okay. Did I have a chain already? Yes. It's go. Yes. Okay. I think it's still pointing to the new service. But let's, so here uh, you can see that it's like your serv your service your website will never go down during update at all. That is one of the feature I like it. Of course, uh, not only Docker Swarm do, uh, doing uh, this one, it's uh, another service like Mesos or Community is also doing the same things. But uh, I feel that Docker Swarm uh, fit for my need, and it's very easy for us to get started. So I, I want to introduce Docker Swarm here. OK, so this is about the deployment and uh, rolling update. And yes, I finished my uh, talk here. If uh, anyone here have a question? Sorry, I was asking if you are just running a single server without load balancing capability. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, advantage to using microservices? Uh, OK, so, sorry, I forget the question before. Um, yes. Uh, like for example, uh, the the demo I'm running now is on my local, on my Mac now. So that means it's only run in the one single server without any load balancing at all. But the thing like if it did uh, distribute your task in a different runner, a different worker, so it can f uh, speed up your processing if you want. If of course you uh, you still have enough resource for the worker to run. OK, auto scaling can be done. Uh, but it need more uh, setup on this, and it's a bit more complex. So basically, uh, from the Docker, you can monitor to see how many resources it's using already. And you can limit the resource for the each container. And like, for example, you say that, OK, this container, I want to run only 1 gig of RAM and 10% of the CPU. <coughs> so for CPU, it's only limit by a uh, relative number only. So CPU is divided by 1,024 unit, and you can choose how many unit you uh, want to allocate it to the um, container. So for example, I when I say 10%, I mean, for example, 100 unit. So if you uh, allocate 100 uh, CPU unit and 1 gig of memory, and if the CPU, if that container is going uh, running out of resource, uh, it will, then you will run another task to monitor all the resource of its container. And as if you see that, OK, this container is running more than 80% of the resource for five minutes, then you launch a new one. So that task you need to uh, done man, uh, manually for now. Or you can write a script to automate it, yes. But uh, for example, for some tool like Kubernetes, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, from what I know, they have an auto-scaling feature. 
So you can set the scaling from minimum uh, of the uh, uh, replicas and maximum of the replica. And it's just scaling up and down from this range. Yep. It's the same concept here. It's just like, because Kubernetes is more mature. It's, it's there already for a few years, and Docker Swarm is just less than one year uh, into the market. So basically, it's not so mature, but all the feature is very friendly with the Docker user. So that's why I want to adopt the, the, the service uh, to the product to, to our community. Yes? Recover the process that's running in it. For example, the video upload is running on that container, and then suddenly it goes down. Can you continue it with the other container? Okay. So basically, one container go down may occur by different reason. So for example, like if the like for example if the server is running running right, you unplug the power, for so there's no way to recover. But the thing like if you send the shutdown signal, for example then it may trigger another recovering uh, process to do it. So for containers, it's, it's the same thing. If accidentally happened by some fatal uh, issue, then uh, I, I don't think we can recover it. But if you send some signal to kill it, then it, you, it can be recovered. Yes. It's not pass over. Like, it's not pass over. For example, like, if you process the video for like 50%, when it, it, it go down, and a new container is launched and uh, processing, it starts from the beginning of the video. Unless you have a mechanism to uh, flag, like, OK, 50% uh, done already. Yeah. Because all your <coughs> the is like how do you handle the errors? It's like something happened, like uh, how the original request didn't know like, uh, something happened, <coughs> the actual the transaction is stopped. Properly. Okay, so basically, uh, for example, if you upload video, right, and video have some, like for example, you upload a file, you say that this is a video, and the file is like 100 gig. It's upload the server and start processing, and like one hour later, you find out, okay, I, we cannot extract the image from the video. So basically, you can run another type like notification service. To send a notification to user, mobile, web, whatever you can using, for example, the um, socket I/O to send the web socket notification to the browser, or you can use the mobile notification to tell the user that okay, your file, your process is failed because of this, this, this. But at least when user upload, you will get immediate feedback. Yep. Another question is for the load balancer. Because <coughs> load balancer, right, you actually is a random bit. Uh, yes. How do you ensure like it's like, still in the timely sequence, or uh, in case like your original event has some like causal uh, relationship between each other? Then can you? Uh, it's like uh, your event one must be before the event two, but your because you are using a uh, uh, load balancing, so it's actually uh, based on something like a long logging or randomly distributed to different uh, worker. The okay. time sequence cannot be ensured. Do you encounter this kind of issue like? Uh, usually, if you want to use uh, uh, message queuing like this, uh, events should not be relied on each other. So, like for example, you have two events, then it should be a different one. But the thing is, like if, for example, the response logging should be done after the request logging, right? It's rely on on another one. So basically, it's uh, the service is also uh, <laughs> listening to the same event. But the thing is, take progress. Take some time to process it, and then it's trick. It send another event to the log service. Yeah. So uh, there's no way to re say that okay, this event must be after the other one. Even you push the pushes to the message queuing, but usually for the message queuing, uh, unless you um, uh, configure it to be a linear, uh, there's no way to guarantee that it uh, follows the time. Also, uh, Property Guru is hiring. So you can go to career.propertyguru.com to find your opportunity. OK, thank you. Thank you, thank you Michael. All right, it's kind of getting late. Uh, I want to take a